Hello, everybody. Welcome to Broadloom's webinar this week. My name is Taylor Rash. I'm on the marketing team at Broadloom and joined here by Steve Silvers, the CEO of Express Flooring. Excuse me. How's it going, Steve? Good, Taylor. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. It's a really beautiful good to day see in Arizona. You're not too far from me. I'm not. It's, it is a beautiful day. and It's great to see you. Yeah, you as well. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about expansion and growth and things like that today. But uh, Steve, you know, a lot of people don't know. I got to know you from my time as your marketing director at Express Flooring. And you had a pretty incredible story on your road there. Would you mind sharing a little bit of that journey with us? Uh, yeah, sure. So my, actually, I, my background is finance and accounting. So I came out of college, uh, got my CPA, uh, went into public accounting, uh, did that for several years and um, kind of went into a family business for a little while. And then ultimately, uh, you know, really how I got into the flooring business was uh, from Empire Carpet, uh, later called Empire Today. But uh, that was that was my start. I went in there as their as their CFO. You know, it was it was owned and operated by an amazing founder, Seymour Cohen, who started uh, Empire Today, probably one of the most successful uh individual uh, kind of flooring uh, entrepreneurs out there uh, when he started because he was way ahead of his game and, and way beyond what many people were doing in flooring. And we, you know, I went in there as a CFO and, you know, he had made the decision he was going to sell his company at some point. Uh, I helped him through that process. Uh, ultimately, it was purchased by a private equity firm out in New York. And we started a path of growth. Back then we were just a carpet company and over, over the years we added product, uh, starting with uh, laminate flooring back then, uh, going, this is going back all the way to 19, you know, 1999, uh, basically at that point, uh, growing into new markets and uh, expanding across the country where at some point uh, when I was there, we were covering about 72% of uh, US households. So. It was a tremendous, uh, tremendous experience. I learned a ton from some really smart people um, that were doing something in Chicago that really nobody else in America was doing at that time. And, um, you know, from there, kind of stayed in the home improvement industry for a while and then landed back here at Express Flooring. And uh, again, uh, got hooked up with an amazing founder who built an amazing business here in, uh, in, in the Phoenix market, uh, bought by private equity and, you know, with a charter to... Let's see if we can take this brand and, and grow it, kind of similar to what, what happened uh, with Empire. Uh, obviously, we were in a much different marketplace than I was back then. Things have changed a lot. The industry's changed. Uh, the way you market has changed. So it's it's really a much different model, and it's a much different way of doing business. But um, but it's exciting, and I'm, I'm having uh, the time of my life and having so much fun with it. So very happy. No, it's great. Thanks for sharing. Um, so a little bit about that, and we talked specifically about kind of the model, uh, things like that. So let's talk about the model of express flooring. You guys, how do you operate compared to like a normal flooring retailer? Yeah, so I mean, it's most of most of everybody I'm sure listening knows, um, you know, express flooring is is very much in that same model as Empire today. Um, we're really a strictly strictly a shop at home business. We don't have any box stores. Um, and it's, it's very much, you know, it's about generating interest with consumers, um, getting them to give us a chance to come out to their home, um, show them samples and, and try and make sales uh, while we're there. So it's, 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 much, it's a much different business model than the traditional flooring retailer or boxed retailer and certainly much different than the big box retailer. Um, our customers probably a little bit different than the customers that are walking into stores. So we're very focused and targeted on you know, our customer, who we believe our customer is, and we work really hard to, to you know, send our message towards them um, so that they'll give us an opportunity. So it's a bit of a, a, bit of a different business model, uh, but it's very much in the, in the classic form of the home improvement industry, whether you're selling siding or windows or roofing or, um, you know, ba basements and, and all that stuff that's out there nowadays. It's very much more familiar to that business model than to traditional uh, flooring. Um, though we still have small showrooms and we still have customers that walk in and those kinds of things, but, but that's not, you know, I would say the kind of the core of our business model. Sure. And it's very, very much what Empire Today does. Same business model. Gotcha. So if you think about that, and I know a lot of this webinar is going to be based on expansion. So let's talk about what a market is really. So you mentioned earlier that 
uh, you know, the, the founder of Express had a presence in Arizona, Phoenix and Tucson. You know, when you look at expanding, what do you look for and what defines a market for Express for? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting, you know, it's picking a market is, um, while it's very difficult, you know, we try not to overthink it. Um, you know, when you're, when you're doing marketing, to some extent, we're looking for population, we're looking for people. Um, you know, certainly you always kind of look at some of the demographic data in the market to just try and understand, you know, what's the age of a household and, um, you know, uh, what does the demographics look like versus what, you know, we know that our, our customer base looks like in our, our legacy markets. Um, um, understand the geographic scope and range of a market, those kinds of things. But really, at the end of the day, there's no huge there's no huge science to it. Uh, I wish it was, it, it would make it much easier if you can kind of look at a report and say, Hey, this is going to be a great market. Or you look at a report, this is not going to be a good market. Um, even, even when I was at empire, you know, it was never as black and white or as easy to understand what the potential of a market's going to be. Some markets respond it fast. Some markets don't respond as fast. Uh, it's just the, the nature of, you know, the type of market it is and, it's hard to put your finger on what describes why that market is the way it is. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's all about, you know, you know, just believing, going in, giving it your all, hiring good people and you hire the right people and you follow the playbook, you know, you can be successful. Um, and, you know, I'm not, not a big believer in there's a lot of difference between one market and another um, at the end of the day, you know, the consumer is the consumer. Uh, and, you know, if they're interested in flooring, uh, we're here to service them. That's really what we try to establish and um, the message we try to deliver out to the marketplace. Gotcha. So another part of that, obviously, when you're looking at new markets is there's, and I want to clarify, there's a pretty significant difference in a market definition for Express and then what would be considered like another location or something like that for a brick and mortar. Uh, a lot of the retailers probably watching today are more than likely a brick and mortar that do a little bit of shop at home. Uh, but what's, how does that differentiate between when you guys are looking at a market to expand to and then maybe a brick and mortar uh, that probably has a much smaller radius? Yeah, well, there, there, there's a, that, that is true. And there's a, a fairly significant difference there, right? Because a traditional brick and mortar store, you know, they're, they're really marketing well, some of them are targeting their marketing in some sort of geographic scope around their store, right? Because most likely if a consumer is going to go out driving, you know, they're not most likely interested in driving 30 or 40 miles or 50 miles to go to a store, right? They're looking for the local store. Um, you know, obviously there's likely going to be a, a, a Home Depot or Lowe's in the general vicinity uh, and those kinds of things. But they're, they're really targeting, you know, they're targeting retailers within a, a tight geographic range around where their flowing project is located most likely, um, or their home, which is probably even most likely scenario. So uh, where our business model, um, you know, we, because we don't have brick and mortar locations, we don't have stores, we do it again, we have small um, showrooms that consumers can come into and we do service markers, markets that way. But the reality is, um, you know, we're really, we're trying to focus on the entire market and we're, because we're, you know, we're doing advertising and we're and we're driving consumer interest. You know, we look at the entire, you know, 50, 60, 100, 120 mile radius. You know, it can be whatever it is we feel we can service around the center of any given market or city. Um, so it, it gives us the ability to, to really target a much larger uh, customer base, which is an important part of our business model, right? Because we spend a lot of money advertising. It's a huge investment, a huge percentage of our expenses is our advertising budget. Uh, and it's very, very expensive to break into new markets. And you have to be, you have to have deep pockets to invest the money to do it. And so you got to maximize that, uh, that investment by having um, a certain number of people within those, within those marketing radiuses. And that's one of the nice things about being a, a brick and mortar owner, I think, if I want to compare it to our business model, you know, one of the advantages I think that they they have is that they can be very targeted. Um, they can scale down their marketing budget um, and really target the specific customers they're trying to reach around 5, 10, 15 miles around their store locations, whether it's one or multiple, and depending on what that overlap could potentially look like. Um, but they, you know, it's much easier for 
for the kind of the mom and pop or the, the brick and mortar stores to be much more targeted uh, with their dollars and, and um, you know, which is, which is good because it doesn't take as big of an investment as compared to what we do where, you know, it, it's definitely uh, the larger, the, the, the bigger the shotgun and the more you shoot out, you know, uh, the, the more expensive it is to, to achieve those goals. So. Sure. So how do you look at competition when going into a new market? Is that a factor? Is it something that you consider? Uh, I remember you had a really good kind of analogy for that before. And I'm just wondering what your thought is on, on competition when researching a new market. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 a little bit of a contrarian when it comes to competition. I think than maybe a lot of the, the people might who be, might be watching this today, um, and even 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 if it's just not flooring in some of the other industries I've been in, especially in home improvement, I actually think competition is is a good thing. Um, and I know that sounds silly. What, what do you mean by that? But I look at I look at any given market. Getting back to that discussion, as as basically a a pie, right? You know, you've got a circle. You got this much demand from consumers out there, and you know one of the things that we do at Express, and what one of the things Empire did very successfully over the years, uh, and and Home Depots and Lowe's, and even, even anyone doing marketing, you're growing the pie, right? So the way I look at it is when we go into a market, you know the demand from the consumer is probably this big, but between my marketing span and other marketing spans, what I'm trying to do is grow that pie which is good for all of us. I mean, the bigger the pie is, that creates consumer demand. And we're not just competing against each other, but we're competing against, against consumer demand for someone who maybe is interested in replacing windows or they're interested in painting or they're interested in doing new window treatments or, or whatever it is. Even, even frankly, you know, uh, walking into Best Buy and purchasing a, a big screen TV, right? We want them spending their money on another big screen TV or do we want to spend it on flooring? And I think, us, all of us who are, who are watching this probably want to want people to spend as much money as flooring as they can. So when I look at a market, I go and, okay, I want to go in there. I want to invest money. I want to grow the pie. And then I just need a small sliver of it. Express just needs a small sliver. I mean, the reality is if you look at the data on the market, shop at home is still a very small percentage of the overall demand um, from a, a, a full flooring uh, retail um, marketplace perspective, right? So we're still very small, but I just want to grow that pie. So my sliver is small, but ideally, frankly, I'm helping everyone because the more I grow the pie, everyone does better. Not just, not just Express, not just Steve Silvers, but the whole industry does better by growing that pie. So I've, I'm a huge advocate and proponent of, of us collectively as a group, recognizing that, yeah, we are in competition to some extent against each other, right? I mean, I want to close the deal. You want to close the deal, whatever it is. We want that individual consumer. But at the same time, I want I want Home Depot. I want Lowe's. I want Empire Today. I want everybody who's listening, even if you're a brick and mortar, you know, carve out dollars, put them into a marketing budget and spend those dollars. Because if we all do it collectively, we're growing, we're growing that pie. And I've, I've even challenged um, the manu carpet, the large carpet manu, the Shaws, the Mohawks, you know, are big, the big vendors out there, you know, even, even some of the, even the distributors, you know, help us, uh, create a bigger pie because not only is the pie helping us as a group, but it's helping our suppliers quite a bit too, because if that demand grows. Um, it's not just our individual demand. It's that pie is growing, which is helping the entire, um, the, the entire pipeline, you know, from the manufacturer, to the distributors, to the retailers, we're all benefiting from that. So I'm, I'm just, I'm really a big believer. I'm not, I'm not in competition against anybody. I'm in competition about my, against myself, frankly, that's the way I look at it. You know, I want to beat what I did last month. I want to beat what I did two months ago. Um, and so I'm in competition against myself and I'm, I'm there just trying to help us all be successful. And I know that sounds ridiculous, right? I mean, we, we all have our own families to feed and, uh, we all have our own, you know, desire to make certain amounts of profits. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I want us all to be successful because if we're all successful, the industry is successful, industry is growing. Uh, and it's great for it's great for all of us, including including problem. Right. You know, more retailers, more people out there spending money. It's good for you guys as well. So I, I, that's the way I, I prefer to look at it from a competition perspective. No, it's such a unique perspective. And I love that analogy because I think a lot of times you know, someone hears that an express or the big guy is coming to town, so to speak, and, you know, they get 
maybe a little bit nervous, but based on that explanation, there's not really reason to, right? I mean, there's plenty of business out there for everyone to kind of gather and succeed. And I mean, technically when Express comes and you know that they're going to spend a large amount of money on marketing and breaking into that, it's only going to benefit everybody else that's already selling flooring in that market. So yeah, such listen, a it, cool it, and we're, listen, we're, we're, some of us are going to serve the customer better than others. So we're going to, we're going to be more successful, but that, that's something we can all focus on, right? I mean, uh, do we have the right samples? Do we have the right products? Um, you know, are we creating a, a service for the consumer that they appreciate? Are we providing good service? Uh, you know, those things, you know, those are things we can control and that we all have to do well. And, and that's, that's the challenge, right? It's, it's, if I'm doing it better or if you're doing it better than me, I got to raise my bar so I can be competitive. Um, and, and I, I like it, you know, when people have really good ideas and they come up with better ways of doing things, you know, I learn from that and I get better as well. So, you know, we, we should all get better from each other and, and learn from each other. That's great. So on the same track of like expansion, growth, things like that. So you've already kind of picked the market. Uh, you haven't really picked any real estate for a warehouse or anything yet you got to get people. You mentioned earlier that you have to have a great team of people. What's the first hire you make? What's the first role you look to fill when you're going into a new market? Yeah. So I'm, listen, I'm a big believer in, you know, we win as a team, we lose as a team. Um, and as an organization, uh, we're, I can spend all the money in the world on everything, marketing and merchandising and facilities. But if I don't have the right players on my team um, and we're not all aligned, rowing the boat in the same direction, we are, we're not going to be successful. And, and, and that goes back. And it's one of the things I, I really learned at Empire today. Uh, we went through tremendous growth and, you know, we built a great team of people there. And there's still you know, a lot of them are still there, frankly. Uh, some have moved on. Some are still there. But, you know, we were only successful at Empire because of the team we built. And along the way in my career, the various stops I've made at, at uh, 1-800-Hansons in Detroit, Michigan, and even here at Express and in other places I've, I've been and other things I've done, you know, I've only I've only been I personally feel like I've only been as successful as my team has been. I, I lean on my team. I'm a true I'm a real believer in hiring people that are smarter than me. Um, which isn't, frankly, isn't very hard. Uh, but I'm a big believer is I, I want to be the stupidest person at the table and, and bring in really good people. And if I do that, I know I can be successful. So when we, when we go into market, um, you know, for, for our business model, I generally feel most things start with sales, you know, so I'm very focused on, on a sales person, a sales manager, whatever it is, whatever that resource needs to be locally. But a lot of it starts with sales. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, in sales, if you, if you can't sell, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck in the mud, right? I mean, at the end of the day, without sales, I can't even, I've got nothing to install. I'm not saying that that's not super important too, because it is, right? That's, that's long-term growth is delivering great service to the customers and be able to install things effectively. But if I can't generate the sale up front, then, you know, I don't have much of a business. I could spend all the money advertising and marketing on the front side, but if I can't sell anything, I'm kind of dead in the water. So we, we like to we like to find good, strong leaders uh, in any given market that we know are leaders. They've got some entrepreneurial spirit in them. They've got a, ability to sell. They've done some sales in the past. They certainly have the ability to sell. That's what we're really focused on. And then but then they also it's really important that they are willing to learn because um, just because you've been successful in the past and doing something else doesn't mean you're going to be successful doing it our way or the express way. And, and so I need, I need to find people that can, can manage their egos um, that have some sales experience, but that also are, are open and willing to learn our way of doing it and, and kind of uh, fall into the culture, believe in the culture, believe in the organization and, and take what we teach them, take it to the market and then drive it locally. Great. So perfect segue. Let's talk about culture a little bit. Um, I remember <clears throat> you, you started a few processes when you came on at Express uh, that really kind of shifted the culture. And there's kind of a two-part question. I'll ask the first one first and then follow up. Um, how important is culture to you? Well, I, I, my, I've, my career has evolved over the last tw 25 years, whatever it is. And, um, you know, I wasn't, I think initially... 
And even as I went through the empire years and I was there for a long time, culture was never necessarily our priority there. You know, we were growing so fast. We had so much stuff going on. It wasn't necessarily about culture. Um, it, and it, at times it was, but it wasn't consistent. But as my career progressed and I've learned more and more from, you know, outstanding uh, founders of companies and other leaders uh, uh, out there, you know, culture's become much more important. And, and now the pendulum is completely on the other side where I kind of believe organizations live and die based on their culture. And I think it goes back to the employees, right, and building the right team. And without the right culture, you can't build the right team. Um, and and even at, at Floricon, when I spoke a couple of years ago, I, I talked a little bit about the concepts of, you know, you got to be able to, you got to have a culture where your leadership team um, and members of the team that you trust, uh, you have a tremendous amount of trust in, and you put them in a position where they're kind of working on the business versus in the business. And, and so part of that is the mentality and the culture. And, and listen, not everybody can do that, right? You, you got chiefs, you've got Indians, and everyone has to know what their roles and responsibilities are and, and have their expectations. But um, I, I, I really, I think if, if you have the right culture, you empower people to make decisions, you treat them with respect, um, you recognize and honor them when they do really good things and you, and you give good coaching and feedback, uh, quality coaching and feedback, right? Because there's also very bad coaching and feedback that, that some people give people that don't help. But if you give good quality, specific coaching and feedback to people, um, you know, that's, that's what creates culture, right? You, you got to live by these things. You got you to know what your mission and values are. You got to build a team of people that are that share those same values with you uh, and your core values. And, and if you do that and you, you, everyone understands what those things are, you'll create the culture. And, and really I'm, I'm hyper-focused. My, my role here as the, the leader of Express Flooring and, and um, right now is, is the culture. And, and that my expectations and when I think one big part of my role here is to create, generate and kind of honor the culture that we're creating displayed in everything I do every single day and let that trickle down to the rest of the organization, starting with my leadership team and then down further from there into the rest of the organization. But uh, I really, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of culture and how important that is to me. And it goes to, and I'll just, I'll, I'll make this the final thing and I'll let you ask the second part of the question, Taylor, if I didn't already answer it, uh, is that, um, you know, you got to, you got to believe in your culture and you got to, you got to, you got to believe in it. And I'm at a point in my career where I just, I want to work with people that I, that I like. I, I want a culture that I want to work in. Uh, I've worked in the past in cultures that at times I woke up and drove to work and why am I doing this? Um, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't necessarily like the people I'm working with. I don't like the culture here. Um, and some of it's probably my fault as well. I take, I take responsibility for that in some of the positions I've had in the years. And I'm not, I'm not there anymore. I don't, I don't want to be there. I want to be at a place where I love to go to work. I love the people I work with, you know, they're my extended family and, you know, we, we trust and we respect each other. And again, we're, we're all, we all know where we're heading. We're all going in the same direction. Yeah, absolutely. Very important. Thank you for that. You didn't answer it yet. So we're good. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> uh, so one of the things just to carry on with that culture and you mentioned feedback earlier, uh, that positive and good feedback can come in many forms, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or even in like team meetings. And one of the things that you were really great at was being kind of transparent uh, and giving feedback of where the company was and you implemented some certain things uh, to help the team understand where we were as a company. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, well, so listen, I've, I've, I've read my share of, of business books at this point, and, and there are a few out there that I, I really love and internalize some of the messaging that goes into them. And there's, there's really great learnings to be had uh, out there. Um, not every book is great and not everything you learn is exactly what it needs to be. But I've, you know, again, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a student and I enjoy learning. And Taylor, you know, I like to ask lots of questions. Um, and it's something that I, I do as a leader is I'm asking lots of questions of everybody around me all the time. It's because I, I just enjoy learning more than anything. And, and so uh, what is part of the culture I'm creating, what I do in meetings is um, 
you know, I'm, I share a message. I share a message of what our culture is, what it looks like, what my expectations are. I share information about how we're doing as an organization, um, not only looking backwards at what the last 30 or 60 days have looked like, but also looking forward. What is the future going to look like? What, what is our vision? Where are we headed? Where is this organization going? So I, I want all the employees in the organization to buy into, you know, where we're coming from, you know, but more importantly, where are we heading as an organization? Looking out the, the front windshield, not just the rearview mirror all the time. Got to be looking through that front windshield. And, and, and so the communication and the message I deliver when I bring our organization together, and I, and I believe in doing that fairly regularly, um, we'll, do, we'll all jump on the Zoom calls, whatever it is. And, you know, I like to deliver a message to the entire organization. I think it's important that they hear it from me uh, at the top as the leader uh, and because I, I, I need to be, you know, it's, it's my message. And, it's, it, you know, if, if they don't hear it from me and they don't hear how much how passionate I am about it, how much I believe in it, why should I expect them to be passionate and believe in it? So I, I really I think it's really important to deliver those messages. And a big part of what I'm talking about underlying a lot of it is trust. Uh, and, and building trust in an organization to me is, is very important, not only with my direct reports, but with everybody up and down the organizational chart. You know, the guy who's working in the warehouse or someone driving a truck, they're just as important and they need to trust me. They need to trust the organization as, as my COO or my CFO does. Everyone within the organization, it's, it's just important that they trust, they tr have trust with what we're doing and where we're going and how we're going to get there. And, um, and I find that the more information I share with people um, and not be shy about it, uh, whether it's the financial position of the company, uh, I mean, you got to be practical about these things and, and I get it. Um, and, and we all have our own views on these, th these things, but you know, I'm, I'd rather share more than share less because it's going to build trust. And if I can build trust with people, it helps drive the culture that I want to do. It's all interconnected at the end of the day. All these things are connected. And, and so uh, I, I just think the messaging, my visibility, things that I say, you know, I, I just want people, I want people to, first of all, I want them to love coming to work at Express. I want them to like coming here. I want them to care about each other. Uh, but, and I want them to trust the leadership team. I want them to trust me, trust each other. And when we do all that, you know, frankly, the, benef the beneficiary of that is, is two people, uh, I believe. Uh, well, first, maybe it's three, it's themselves. You know, if they like coming to work, we all like life is better when we enjoy what we're doing, both personally and professionally. So I, I think they benefit from it. But I also think um, our consumers, the customers, obviously, the customers benefit from it. You know, a happy employee is much easier to make a happy customer at the end of the day. Um, so I, I'm a big proponent of that. But I also have investors I have to answer to, too. So if I build a good culture, everyone trusts each other. We're all motivated, doing the right things. Hopefully we're financially performing well, which also makes my investors very happy. Yeah, absolutely. Probably pretty important to, to keep them happy. Uh, most uh, of the time. They're, they're, they're certainly up there. It's important to keep them happy, 100%. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about kind of data, right? And as we segue out of that, because you talked about trusting your employees, having other people trust you. Uh, if you have data, it's pretty easy to kind of show that, right? Where um, you know, you don't need a lot of kind of blind trust if you can base that trust in data. Uh, from my time there, Express was very data driven, probably more than most companies for sure, most flooring companies. Um, but how important is data and how do you leverage that in your day-to-day -day business? Yeah, so that's, I mean, I think that goes to a, a bit to my leadership style, which, you know, was partially formed many, many years ago. Um, and, but, but it is, uh, you know, I'm, I think was, I think becoming from an accounting background, right. I'm a, I'm a CPA, I'm an accountant. Uh, I did public accounting for a while. I, you know, I've done audits, I've done tax work. I've done all these kinds of things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a numbers guy. Uh, I'm a big spreadsheet guy. I'm a big numbers guy. Um, you know, Taylor, you can, you could speak to, you know, when I have conversations with people, if I can't picture something in a spreadsheet, it's hard for me to connect to the information. So uh, that's just how I learn. Part of, part of the way I learn is yeah, I'm a very visual learner and it's helpful for me to see things in, in boxes and numbers and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's how I digest information and data uh, most effectively. 
So me personally, I'm, I'm a big numbers guy and I believe in, in, in managing to metrics um, and to measuring basically as much as I possibly can. I mean, I'll, I'll push people to measure things that they probably thought was actually impossible to measure, but there is, there is always a way to, to kind of figure out a way through some of that stuff. So I, I love, I love numbers. I love metrics. I love, you know, it comes back to, you know, the basic one-on-one business principles of, you know, defining what your KPI are, what are your key performance metrics um, and having the organization understand what those are going back to, the communication and building trust, you know, people need to understand what are the KPIs that we measure the performance of the company by. And it's not just, it's not just profit at the end of the day. I mean, certainly that's the most important metric at the end of the day is profit. Uh, but, but, you know, there's the concepts of leading indicators versus lagging indicators and I'm not going to save everyone that the boring discussion around that and the understanding around it, but you got to understand your metrics. You got to understand what's, what's driving your business. And how, and then how to look backwards and understand what those results were, and they deliver what you expect them to deliver. So I, I measure, I as an organization, I push all my leaders I, uh, to 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 trickle down metrics to understand what our metrics are, what are the things that drive our business, and it frankly it makes it much easier at the end of the day to hold people accountable. You know, I'm I I'm not um, my style and my leadership style. I'm not a big yeller and screamer. I, I think I talked about that at, at, even at FloorCon and you're probably getting that from this, uh, this discussion as well. I mean, I'm passionate and I love what I do and I'm into it, but I'm not, you know, there's lots of founder, founders and entrepreneurs out there that are hairs on fire constantly and, and all that kind of stuff. That's not the way I choose to live my life. Um, I'm, I'm very pragmatic, but it, it being pragmatic allows me to focus on what the numbers are and then hold people accountable to those numbers. I mean, it, you know, hold people accountable doesn't have to be confrontational. From my perspective, it doesn't have to be, you suck. You didn't do a good job. You didn't, you know, it doesn't have to be mean. It doesn't have to be, I don't believe that stuff is motivating as well very much. I think beating people down isn't motivating. I like to say, hey, hey, Mike, man, we, we were supposed to, um, you know, you were supposed to install 10 jobs on Tuesday um, and we wanted to achieve X number of five-star reviews out of those 10 jobs. Let's look at the data. What did you actually achieve? And let's talk about why you did achieve it. And is there something we need to do? Is there some way I can support you in the future so we can achieve what those what those goals are and what those metrics are? And uh, and then you hold people accountable that way. And if, if it's two weeks, three weeks, four weeks later, he can't get there because of something he's doing, not that the company is not supporting him or I'm not supporting him, but clearly Mike just isn't getting it. To me, those are very easy conversations to have with with employees at that point. Listen, this, this is probably just not a great fit for you. Um, let's uh, maybe it's time you don't seem happy. We're not happy. We're not getting the results. Maybe it's time to move on. And and those those are the kinds of conversations that I'm more comfortable having with people uh, from an accountability perspective. Um, and frankly, because that's the kind of conversations I expect people to have with me. You know, people I've reported to over the years is you know, I don't. I don't like, I'm not a big generalities and kind of, you know, we did this terribly. Well, we've done it terribly twice out of 30,000 times. It's is it really that big a deal. <laughs> Let's put it into perspective. And, and so I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm not an emotional guy. I don't lead by emotion. I don't want to be managed by emotion. Um, and um, that's what, that's, what's been successful for me. And, um, and it starts with metrics. Metrics is my safe place, my comfortable place. And, and I think we, you know, I've shown a lot of, I've been pretty successful uh, centering around the data and the metrics as how to manage and lead a company. Yeah. And it provides a cushion for you as well. Right. So if someone comes to you with this grand idea, um, you know, show me the data, show me the metrics where you, what's your ex expected result? What's the hypothesis? Where do you think you're going to get? Um, and if the data doesn't line up, it takes the emotional response right out of it and just says, the data's not there. Yeah, and, and listen, Taylor, you, you know that from firsthand experience. I mean, I I love new ideas. I, I mean, I'm I am passionate about creating ideas and testing ideas and learning. I mean, again, that's that's what that's what gets me going every single day. Frank, it's not about flooring and floor covering. It is, I just love concepts and ideas and doing things and making change and all those kinds of things. But I I'm also only comfortable doing it with it if I can understand what potential outcome this can result in, you know, what, what does it look like? What are the, 
what is if we invest this money here, what do we expect to achieve by it? And, and what are the numbers? What are the metrics we're going to measure that outcome by? And then postmortem against it. How did we do? Did we think, did we achieve what we think we were going to achieve? We didn't. Do we need to turn this dial a little bit more? Or is this just a bad idea? And let's move on from it. It's not emotional. It's, it's just, it is what it is. And I, I'm a huge, I really enjoy trying new things. I throw out 10 stupid ideas every single day to my leadership team here. And, and they, they're all welcome to tell me that's a stupid idea. Uh, and, and they come to me with ideas every single day. And, and when they do, I challenge them and say, I, it sounds like a great idea. Go put it in a spreadsheet. Let me see what the numbers look like. Tell me what you think you're going to get out of it. And let's, then, let's have another conversation with the numbers in front of us. And sometimes that's hard, right? You're, you're kind of making stuff up, big assumptions and all those kinds of things, but that's okay. If I get something down on a piece of paper, I've got something to measure uh, the outcome against. And it gives me it gives me a way to correct as I'm going along too, right? Because the best ideas are never the best ideas. They evolve over time, uh, and metrics, frankly, evolve over time as well. So you have to be flexible and and move a- along with these things as you're doing them. So, um, but you can't do that. At least I personally can't do that without having a, a ground floor. My ground floor is definitely always some sort of metrics and KPIs to understand again where I'm going in the future, how I'm going to get there and what do I need? What are the metrics I need to achieve to accomplish these goals? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so I think, I mean, this has been a great conversation. I know we have a bunch of people watching probably with some questions. I think we'll invite uh, our VP of marketing, Jeff, in to kind of moderate that. Um, Jeff, are you there? Here we go. All right. <laughs> All right. I, uh, no, I have uh, my pup pushing in, of course, as we go live, but that's working from home for all of us. So first off, Steve, thanks for sharing all those insights. I think if they're a seasoned flooring retailer or if they're new and trying to figure out where to go next, uh, these are really good things for people to check in on. You know, uh, the health of the location that they're going, the health of their team, and we have a ton of questions to get through. So um, I'd love to start to chat uh, through those now. So the first one that we saw come in, uh, Steve, you spoke a lot about advertising. And I think one of the things that we constantly see across the board and you know, the questions we get from retailers are, what type of advertising works best? Because we all know the tried and true power of traditional, but digital really helps you lock in the ROI and helps you measure it better. So uh, what advertising you know, types perform best for you? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, and, and I think it, it varies. So I wish it was a black and white answer. I think it, it does, it can vary by market. It can vary based on all kinds of messaging, the messaging that goes into it, the budgets, um, the actual channel that, that you, you know, marketing channel you're using. And, you know, obviously there's good and bad. Uh, there isn't, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't pinpoint any specific one that is the best. Again, it goes back to my me- mentality of, I just like to test different things and learn. They're all contributors at the end of the day. You know, I kind of, we like to do a little bit of everything. I mean, certainly leading with television. I mean, you know, we, we do uh, spend a lot of money on television. It's very much like the Empire Day model. You know, TV is still an amazing way to get a hold of a lot of people. It, it helps grow that pie for all of us. So, you know, I'm a big believer and it's a very, it's a branding exercise quite a bit. Um, but and it creates, it creates not only that, you know, it creates pie and it creates interest in flooring. So, you know, obviously TV is, TV is really good. And, you know, we like to lead with TV, um, you know, and TV is frankly not going away, no matter what you hear from other professionals out there. Uh, TV, TV is just not going, it's not going to go away. It just, it never will. It's going to be there. I'm, I'm a big believer in it. Uh, and then obviously digital, you know, all the various, there's so many digital ways of doing these things right nowadays, which you guys know at, at Broadloom, uh, there's so many different ways and methodologies. And it's not just Google and Bing anymore. There's, there's so many other things that are happening out there um, that, you know, you, you, you kind of have to do that stuff too. Uh, you have to do it all. And, and we, we measure, you know, it goes back to KPI um, and Taylor, what we did quite a bit, right. Is, is we, we really have to measure, the return on the investment dollar for each of our marketing channels and whatever's performing well, we'll lean into further this time, or maybe next time we'll lean into further more. Maybe we try some direct mail because that's shown some promise somewhere. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's very much a very detailed analysis that you have to, we do at a by market basis, by, uh, by marketing channel basis. And we'll lean into where we are finding we're getting the best results from. So I don't, I know that's probably not the answer anybody wants to hear. Everyone wants to hear what's the silver bullet? What's the perfect marketing uh, place for me to invest my money as a retailer? The reality is there isn't a perfect answer. You got to be willing to try different things, to test different things, because the creative can have such an impact on it uh, as well, you know. And um, so it's it's really there is no silver bullet. But uh, if you're going to do it, just measure the outcome, figure out ways to measure the results and then lean into the places that are performing the best and always be looking at it because it can change. I've seen things change month over month or two months or quarter over quarter pretty dramatically. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, boy, we got to go this way right now. Uh, we got to go back this way. And and it's evolving. It's always evolving. So pulling that back up just for a second, integrated media, a little bit of traditional, a little bit of digital, and be flexible, right? Optimize relentlessly where you're seeing that success coming through. Is that a fair takeaway? Very fair takeaway. Yeah, it's, you always have to be optimizing yeah, all the time. And then just one small plug for all the retailers out there. Taylor shared this with me, talking about new TV spots. Express's new TV spot with the tank is incredible. So if you want to see the power of effective TV, check that out because standing on the market is you know really the key for a lot of these retailers. And that actually comes up to one of the next questions that we had, um, which looks like a new retailer. Uh, what advice would you give to a new retailer looking to grow? Right, they might not have TV dollars day one or the market insights that you have. So. You know, where would you start if you were starting your own flooring business today? Um, yeah, I, I think, um, listen, at the end of the day, it starts with building the right team, right? I mean, if, if you're small and you're doing it on your own, then it, it's your own. Um, and I think then it's, it's really just, you know, identifying what is it about your business? What are you trying to achieve? You know, there's, you could do a SWOT analysis to understand what your strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats are and, and understand this is what I'm really good at and stay focused at what you're really good at and drive that. Um, you know, I, as a, as a small business owner, you certainly, you can be super flexible, which is nice. You don't have, you, your margins can be slimmer because you don't have as much overhead. You can do certain things that create a lot of flexibility for yourself. So use that to your advantage, outmaneuver the bigger retailers, outmaneuver the express floorings and the empire days of the world, Lowe's and home depots, you have a lot of flexibility, which I think is, is an advantage for you. Um, and it also gives you an advantage that, um, you know, you can deliver a, probably a better experience than most retailers, right? You can deliver a very uh, hands-on, touchy-feely, great experience for the consumer with great follow-up to the consumer, build those referral programs. I mean, it, if you're doing it yourself and it's a very small business, you know, I would I would lean into into very much, um, very much into the concept of a great, great experience for every customer I touch. All right. Well, we all know how important creating that memorable great experience is, um, but we also have a handful of questions from the live YouTube chat as well. Um, so the first one is from Wally's Carpet and Tile. Uh, I think it's from Chris uh, on that team. Uh, so, you know, you guys mentioned, and Taylor's talked about this a lot, you know, being primarily shop at home, right. And really focusing on that. But we also know the digital setup is a bit difficult, uh, based on how Google set up with things like Google, my business and locations. So you know, how do you guys either invent or use that to your advantage? And this one, I actually want to start uh, with Taylor on just from his experience boots on the ground. And then, you know, we'll take it back to you, Steve. So Taylor, what was the way that you uh, navigated that without really those physical showrooms uh, in all the markets? Yeah, so what's interesting is Google is still very archaic when it comes to Google My Business. So when you set up a new location, things like that, you still have to get a postcard snail mailed to you from Google with a confirmation code, and you have to put that in. But the way you get around that is basically – you know, wherever the warehouse is or whatever that location is, uh, you have it sent there and then you can actually set up service areas. Um, so instead of being, you know, this is your location and setting up a radius, 
uh, for all the surrounding areas, towns, cities, whatever else. You can just set up kind of service areas so you'll still show up in those areas. That's the easiest answer, I guess. <laughs> all right. So, you know, setting up the service area, Steve, uh, have things yeah. sort of changed at least from how you've seen things? I know this is heavy on the technical side. Yeah, my answer goes back to kind of what I talked about before is surround yourself with really smart people and let them figure out how to do those things. Uh, I don't, I don't, I think Taylor's answer is, is uh, a good sound answer. I, I personally, I don't, I don't, I let the, uh, the, the technology and the, uh, the digital guys figure all that stuff out. I just tell them what they need to do, <laughs> what I expect them to deliver and they have to figure out how to deliver it. So vision, strategy, and then execution seems to be the holy trinity in that sense. Very, very much so. Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, I, I really, again, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm barely a moron on most stuff. So uh, I really, I really just, I, I've only been as successful because, you know, I've, I've had great people mentor me, great founders of companies that I've, I've helped participate in and, and just surrounded myself with really smart, good people. Um, I like, again, I'll, I'll ask them the questions. They'll go get the answers and then go figure out how to execute on it. All right. That's a great response on both sides. Thank you, gentlemen. So uh, we have the next question from Mr. Buckles uh, that has to do with culture. And Steve, you have a ton of culture, uh, you know, at least statements behind you that, you know, evoke or at least speak to the culture that you're building at Express. But when you're building that out, when you're rapidly growing, I'm sure people is probably one of the most important things because you already have your process and systems built out. So, you know, how do you find people to staff these markets uh, across the board and how do you instill that corporate culture? Uh, Cause hiring is one of the hardest things to do out there. Yeah. Well, so I, I again, I, I'll, I'll share a concept, uh, a business kind of book concept out there um, at, that you need to hire towards your core values. So, uh, you know, the basics of finding people, you know, frankly, isn't really that hard, right? There's, there's all kinds of um, websites out there that you can, you know, you post jobs and people respond, right? Uh, so, you, you know, that, that's, you know, finding good people, you, you can get people to respond. The question is, you know, how do you find the good people, right? And, and to me, what's the definition of somebody that's good? Well, the way I look at it is, you know, I want to find people that share our core values, and we've got very specific core values and it's a very specific lens we use uh, when we are recruiting people. It's not even recruiting, I would say more hiring people. So the recruiting part of it is just to create a funnel of applicants. But when you start sorting through resumes and you start doing interviews with people, you know, we, we're very hyper-focused on do they share our core values in the conversation? We'll ask questions around what our core values are. We'll ask them just, hey, give us an example where you you show this value in this company you work for. And if, if we as a group collectively, and it, again, it depends on the position and how many people participate in the interview process, uh, but you know, we will we'll use that lens and we'll want to understand if they don't share our core values, the things that we think drive our company and the success of our company, we won't hire them. You know, they, could be, they could be the best flooring person ever, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know, put, maybe that's somebody listening here. I don't know who that person is, but it could be the best industry person ever. Maybe it's you, Jeff. You know, if, if I'm hiring you, Jeff, the best marketing guy, genius out there in the, in the floor covering industry right now, if I'm hiring you, but you in the interview process don't share my core values, I'm not going to hire you because you're not going to fit into my culture, which goes back to how do you create that culture? Well, you, you start by hiring the right people. Uh, and then you make sure everyone within the organization understands what those core values are. You display them as a leadership team and everything you single do, you do every day, you got your leadership team has to believe in it, right? So collectively best if you, it's, you know, a lot of the people here are entrepreneurs, they're business owners, but if you're defining your core values based on yourself only and your leadership team isn't part of that process, they're not going to believe in them. They really, our core values weren't necessarily generated by me, but they were generated by the team. So my leadership team, we as a group collect created them. And if we all believe in them, we all created them together. They believe in them. They're trickling that down to their direct reports, which is trickling down further in the organization. And we talk about them a lot. We hire towards them. And, you know, it just kind of at some point, once that wheel starts turning, which is the key, get that wheel turning. 
once that wheel's turning, it, it takes off and it's, it's not as difficult as it sounds, but you got to be committed to it 100%. And, and I kind of believe it, it starts with those core values and, and hiring through them and making sure everybody understands what they are. Absolutely. And I think, you know, at least from what I've been able to observe, uh, seeing Taylor and the relationships that he keeps with, you know, all the express uh, employees, it seems like they're best friends, longtime friends, staying in touch. Taylor, what was that like in the business uh, on your side? Uh, the things that you looked around and you said, this is my tribe. We all have the same mindset and idea of the place we want to work. You know, how is that for you on the other side of things being hired into express? Yeah, I think it really makes things easy. Right. I mean, Steve talked earlier about how you want to love coming to work and you want to like who you work with, things like that. Uh, if you have kind of like minded people or if you have people that are share core values, things like that, you don't have to work towards those relationships. And, you know, the easiest relationships are the ones you don't have to put a lot of work into. They just kind of happen. Um, and I think uh, there's quite a few of the team members um, from Express that I'm still in touch with and play golf with and whatever else. And, uh, you know, that just shows the culture within the building there uh, isn't fake, right? Like it's a true, real culture when you can have someone leave uh, and still be connected to the team members. When I didn't know any of them before I started working there, uh, and now we have, you know, continued uh, friendships and relationships uh, for the long haul. So I think it just goes to show that if you have the right people and they're the right fit with the culture and everything else, it doesn't matter uh, all the other stuff you can kind of get through and you can work through. But if, if you're all going the same direction, uh, it definitely uh, makes it really easy to kind of enjoy what you do. Now, look, when you're looking for a new job, right, there's sort of that dating period. And you were talking about once you were in the relationship, but Taylor, what about Express pulled you into it? Um, you know, was it seeing what that culture was like? Was it seeing how they were attacking the market? Uh, you know, the professionalism that everyone had, what were the things that brought you over to Express? Yeah, I think it was the challenge, right? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of unique because uh, I was there just a little bit before Steve. Um, I think maybe nine, 10 months or whatever that may be. Um, so the culture that I was hired into was very different than the culture that I left. Uh, and that would seem kind of backwards, but um, that's just is what it is. Um, but it was really the challenge with the understanding. When I came in, it was right in the middle of the acquisition. Um, they needed some help with their digital marketing. Uh, it was kind of told to me like, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be growing. We're going to be doing all this stuff. It's going to be exciting. And that was really uh one of the main reasons why I came on is because of the challenge. I mean, we're taking this, I don't want to say small, um, but smaller in comparison operation and, you know, making it national, things like that. Like for a, for a marketer, that's a really exciting thing to be a part of. Absolutely. I mean, as a marketer, your opportunity to rapidly expand doesn't come, you know, all too often. So, just hearing that timeline, Steve, it sounds like you saw Taylor at Express and said, this is a place that I have to work, right? Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, it was, we, had, we, had, we had, you know, Taylor was here as there was a lot of evolution happening uh, in the organization and a lot of change, a lot of evolution. Um, but it was, but it was ideally for the most part, it was fun, right? I mean, I, I don't want to put Taylor, words in Taylor's mouth, but you know, it was, it's fun and challenging. And, you know, you also have to be the right person to enjoy that kind of stuff. You know, not everyone's crap, cracked up for, for the challenges that come with, with some of that stuff. But um, listen, I just, I just want to, again, I want to go to work in a place that I, I enjoy going to work to every single day. So, um, and that's been an evolution of making sure everyone at Express felt, felt the same way. All right. I mean, yeah, I, I think you want to be with like-minded people in the same, you know, in the foxhole together, all on one mission. So totally makes sense there. Uh, Steve, we're almost coming up on an hour and we want to be super respectful of your time. So we're going to have one more question from uh, Rebecca Welsh. Uh, and I had to quickly look this one up so I knew what I was talking about. Uh, Steve, do you follow the concepts of EOS and you're smarter than I, EOS being, I think, the entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurial operating system 
Um, and if not, what are your top two leadership resources that have inspired you to create a great company culture? Uh, great, great question, Rebecca. So the kind of the answer is uh, quick. Yes, uh, we do follow. Uh, there's a book out there called Traction uh, that is based on an uh, EOS system, and we we do follow that process. And uh, I find it uh, there. You go, Taylor has the book. So we we do. We've done a complete implementation of it, and uh, actually we're still evolving with it as we're using it and as we get better. But um, we I find it's a, it's an amazing tool. Um, if you if you can read the book, believe in the concepts, follow the concepts get your leadership to believe in those concepts. But yeah, it, it goes back again to, I'm kind of a structured guy. So I, I like, I like structure. I like things to be defined and, and that allows uh, the organization to kind of absorb these things and continue to grow and stuff like that. So um, it's been hugely, it's been hugely helpful. I can't say I, I followed it. Uh, this is something that I've discovered probably in the last two, two and a, two years, two and a half year, maybe three years, but um, it's, it's newer for me to be as structured. I mean, I think a lot of the concepts are frankly, at the end of the day, they're all kind of, kind of just make sense, right? It's common sense type of stuff. But when you could, when you can take common sense and put it into, into some boxes and some squares and you follow that, um, it helps create consistency and, and those kinds of things. So I, I, I enjoy it quite a bit. And I think it's a very helpful for me to, and for my leadership style, it's very helpful for, for me to kind of achieve some of my own personal goals. Yeah, I think having a framework to fall back on and to help communicate some of those ideas, like you said, you might read this and say, of course, that's common sense. But I think it's how you position it and how you present it is really key. So, uh, you get for those who didn't catch traction, the book. Sorry, Steve, you're saying? No, that was good. I was just going to say, you know, it, it is all about framing. Um, and if it's framed properly, it's easier to absorb and implement. At the end of the day, though, it's, isn't it all about doing the work? Taylor, <laughs> you? Do the work. There we go. All Thanks, right. Steve. Well, that was an incredible hour. Uh, thank you, Taylor. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, these insights, you know, this knowledge is going to help a lot of foreign retailers navigate what could be a very costly expansion, but it seems like when you look at the crux of it, your marketing mix, it's the culture you build, the processes, and, you know, just doing the work, right? We're going to bring it all back together. Um, but uh, if anyone has additional questions, uh, please make sure to uh, send this uh, via email or send it over and we'll get them answered. But again, uh, give a round of Mr. Taylor Rash, and we will see you guys in two weeks for another webinar on a new product release on the Broadloom side. Uh, we're not going to announce until you get that first email, but we got some exciting new things to debut to help you save an immense amount of time in the showroom. Taylor, is there any other uh, TF that you want on there, given that you're overseeing this? Nope. All right, we're going to leave it at that. All right. Well, have a wonderful Wednesday, everyone. Thank you very much. And, Thank you. Uh, you know, happy selling. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Good luck, everybody.